please welcome Bruce Kopic. Thank you, President Cardin, Provost Daly, ladies and gentlemen of the Board of Directors, distinguished members of the faculty, but most importantly, you guys, the members of the Colburn Schools Class of 2016. It's an honor to be here today to congratulate you on your accomplishments. It's no simple feat, and I'm sure that each of you appreciates that without the tremendous support of your families and the commitment and guidance of your teachers, you couldn't have found yourselves here today. Not just the faculty who taught you at Colburn, but all of those who, from the very beginning of your studies at age four or five, invested in you and helped you find your way. Please never forget the debt of gratitude you have to all those people Please never forget that without the superior early training you received, your teachers at Colburn wouldn't have had the opportunity to mold you into the burgeoning artists you are today. It's my fervent hope that you will forever thank the people behind the scenes who formed the extraordinary network of support that's gotten here, you here today. Let's remember the leadership of Richard Colburn in making the visionary gift to make this school possible. And the noble men and women of the school's board of directors and administration who brought that vision to life in 10 short years. You are the beneficiaries of others' tremendous generosity and passion for giving young musicians the best possible training. Humility before the efforts of those who've helped you is a great place to start our conversation today. Of course, each of you deserves all kinds of praise and credit for having the gift, the grit, and the capacity for hard work that makes you the highly accomplished musicians you've become. You are among the elite few who had the wherewithal, the focus, and the determination to gain acceptance into Colburn and to make it through its rigorous curriculum. So while I hope you always show deep, ongoing humility before all those who supported you, you must always take enormous pride in having reached this moment of transition in your lives. Benjamin, your story of your vulnerability gives me great hope for the future of classical music. It's an inspiring story. And Jenna, your generosity of spirit is equally deeply inspiring. It makes me feel as if I almost have nothing more to say to you today. It's been my great fortune to thrive in the classical music business for over 40 years. It's been a wonderful journey. But whether it feels like a wonderful journey or unending misery is a choice each of us has to make. <laughs> Daily, weekly, and yearly. I've had the pleasure and honor of playing with and working with musicians at every level in the classical music world. Musicians who struggle to literally to put one note after the next. Musicians who live at the very highest levels of classical music at the international level and every level in between. I've learned a lot from all those encounters, from terrible mistakes I've made and from continually trying to improve. I'm grateful for the chance to share a bit of that with you today. I don't want to spend a lot of your time today talking about the world of orchestras, except to say how proud I am of the work we did at the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra to create a far more egalitarian and musician-driven culture. In my work over the past 25 years leading two orchestras, the St. Louis Symphony and the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra, as Sal said, the dominant theme of my work has been to empower musicians in the orchestra to take leadership roles, not just in orchestra politics or union negotiations, although that's very important, but in the artistic life of the orchestras and even more importantly, in their own artistic well-being. My commitment to trying to make musicians' lives more vibrant got me in a lot of trouble over the years, but in St. Paul, after 15 years of struggle, difficult and pitched battles within the orchestra, I'm, ver 
I'm very proud to say that the artistic affairs of the SBCO are now completely in the hands of its musicians. First, we eliminated the position of music director, which made a lot of people very upset, especially conductors. Over time, the SBCO has become virtually conductorless, with conductors only involved for big projects like the St. Matthew Passion. Everything else is either led by SBCO musicians or by one of its six artistic partners, each of whom spends three or four weeks a year at the SBCO. Artistic partners are chosen for the distinctiveness and imagination of their own playing and their chemistry with the musicians of the SPCO. People like the Swedish clarinetist Martin Frust, the German pianist Christian Zacharias, and the Moldovan phenomenon violinist Patricia Kopaczynskaya, among others. With those people, concerts have become love fests for musicians and audiences alike. So the musicians more or less control everything from who becomes a member, the programming, the ratio of rehearsal time to number of concerts, who appears as a guest, and most importantly, the preparation and interpretation of the music. We could spend all day talking about the challenges of musician self-governance, but that's for another time. The culmination of this work to put musicians in charge of their own artistic affairs came concurrently with my retirement last December, when we formally transferred all of my artistic responsibilities and authorities out of the executive office and into a newly created position of artistic director, now held and to be forever held, with the, uh, with the enthusiastic support of his colleagues by Q. Young Kim, the SPCO's principal second violinist. Why Q earned the support of his colleagues, the confidence of the board, and the confidence of the international and artistic business structure of the, of the classical music world um, is what I want to talk to you about today. Of course, he plays extremely well and is a highly accomplished chamber musician, but that's not why he got the job. He got the job because of superior interpersonal skills unending intellectual and musical curiosity, and above all, a ravenous interest in the wider music world of music. And finally, his humility, his willingness to submit himself to a huge learning curve, working with me over the past two and a half years, getting himself ready for the job. It was deeply impressive. Imagine a sitting member of a major American orchestra who is its artistic director. It's truly a new day. I started off with the story of Q because I want to talk to you very seriously about aspects of your upcoming careers that are crucially important and which I don't believe get the attention that they deserve. What I'm about to say may make you uncomfortable, but it's really, really important. I have to tell you that there's nearly zero correlation between how well you play how much adulation you receive, and how you will feel about your place in the world. And there's nearly no correlation between how much money you earn, how famous you are, and how content you are. We're a culture teeming with supremely accomplished musicians, and yet so many of those same musicians, brilliant musicians, struggle mightily with the entirely human issues of self-respect, interpersonal relationships, generosity of spirit, and fundamental emotional health and happiness. Those are the qualities that got Q the position of artistic director at the SPCO. The truth is that playing extremely well is an absolute requirement, but on its own, it's an utterly insufficient set of skills to make a full career. There are two main aspects of this one entirely personal and one completely interpersonal. Your own well-being during your careers in music will be far more determined by the healthiness of your relationship with music itself, your humility before the challenge of being a musician than anything else. People with humility, unremitting intellectual and artistic curiosity, and thirst for knowledge people who understand that there is far more to know than they themselves already know, 
Those are the people who end up with satisfying careers and who have something meaningful to say to audiences. That's the self-care part. Then there's the interpersonal part, the diplomatic skills, the ability to celebrate and learn from others' successes, the leadership skills to turn your own ideas into reality that makes the difference between musicians who are in control of their destiny and those who simultaneously feel entitled and powerless to change their own circumstances. There are many things you won't have control over in the coming years and decades. Whether you win an audition across the street or a big competition across the pond, whether you play as well as the person next to you or become as famous as they do, whether someone runs a red light and smashes your hand, as happened to me 27 years ago, whether you're diagnosed with a life-threatening disease in middle age, and all kinds of other life-altering events. You can't control any of that, I'm sorry to say. But there's lots you can control. In fact, there's far more that you can control than the stuff you can't. That's where your work begins today. And it's the work you must do for the rest of your lives. It's about the choices you make and the attitude you bring to your lives as musicians and as people every day. You can control whether you remain curious about the world of music and musicians. You can control whether you're in love with music and love with the process of being a musician or in love with the rather elusive idea of being famous. You can control whether you continue to grow as artists or whether you rest on your various laurels. You can control whether you wait for the world to come to you or whether you step out and embrace a world of possibilities. You can control how you deal with the inevitable upsets. And equally importantly, you can control how measured you are in understanding the temporal meaning of your many inevitable successes. You can control whether you understand that the work before you is to sculpt your own life in music. This reminds me of an old Chinese proverb that I've lived by and, and lived with for the last 40 years. The proverb goes, a peasant must stand on a hillside for a long time with his mouth open before a roast duck flies in. In other words, it won't be served up to you on a platter. You'll need to go out and cook it. Many of us who've had the good fortune to be successful will volunteer that luck had a lot to do with it. But it's hard to know in life what constitutes luck. How was I to know that breaking my left hand in a car accident became a transformational moment in my life? opening up a world of possibilities in music, in my own personal development, and my professional career. Sure didn't feel like luck sitting in the emergency room with a scalpel-happy surgeon trying to operate on my hand. But when I found the right one, and he reconstructed my hand, he had a very interesting answer for my most obvious question, which was, will I ever be able to play the cello again? He answered it with a fundamental challenge about personal choices. He said, Bruce, I can't guarantee you'll ever be able to play the cello again, but I can absolutely guarantee that if you don't assiduously and faithfully do the physical therapy I'm about to prescribe, you definitely won't ever play the cello again. It's your choice. He proceeded to outline a regimen of alternating hours of exertion and soaking my hand, a two-hour sequence repeated six times daily. Those 12 hours daily not only healed my hand, but taught me more about life, the value of grit, and the power of choices than anything I ever learned from formal training. When after four months of the daily 12-hour ritual, I could finally touch my fingertips to my palm, it was as great a joy as you can imagine. How could I have known how lucky I was to be able to participate in such a completely transformational experience? We just never know. My little 12-hour daily routine provided ample time, believe me, for reflection about the cello, about music, about my career. What's really important, because the stakes felt little, very high. I had two very small children. 
It turned out that a broken hand opened up a world of possibility, a world of creativity, and the opportunity to function at a far higher level of accomplishment in the world of orchestra leadership than I ever had as a cellist, despite having maintained a perfectly decent career as a cellist in Boston for 20 years. So why am I boring you with this personal story? Well, it's because it's a lens on the critical importance of what attitude you choose to bring to the path ahead. You're entering the profession at a very interesting time. Whether you thrive will depend in large measure on a whole range of skills you probably weren't taught in the studio, in theory class, or in your chamber music coachings, nor should you have been. If you're lucky enough to win that job across the street, or you found a quartet, or you're chosen for a teaching position, or if you develop a portfolio career, the difference between whether you find yourself content, engaged, and musically alive at age 50, let alone 70, will have far more to do with your relationship to music to itself and how you navigate the tricky waters of the intense personalities around you than it will depend on how you play. Your contentment will depend on your leadership skills, your idealism, how vigorously you tend to your own garden of love for music, and the self-care you show in maintaining your own artistic identity. Only you can create a firewall between cynicism and idealism. If you don't learn to protect your passion and your love for the journey of being a musician, the music world could swallow you up. Please, please don't let that happen. Over the years, I've worked on a little list of ideas to work by. Terribly simplistic, but the result of years of observation, terrible mistakes I've made, and the odd success. It keeps me headed in a positive direction. Here's my list, and I challenge you to develop one over your careers for yourselves. Love of music, no matter where and in what form you're engaged with it. Musical and intellectual curiosity. Being inspired by those who are better than you and gracious to those less accomplished than you. Focus, grit, determination. Honesty, even in the face of discomfort. Seeing opportunity and possibility where obstacles appear. No cynicism, no self-promotion, and no self-pity. In a commencement address 10 years ago, Stephen Colbert said the most insightful thing. He said, cynicism, you think this is going to be funny, but it's actually quite serious. <laughs> cynicism masquerades as wisdom, but it's the farthest thing from it. Because cynics don't learn anything. Because cynicism is a self-imposed blindness, a rejection of the world. Because we are afraid it will hurt us or disappoint us. The great German poet, Rainer Maria, uh, Maria Rilke, in his letters to a young poet, poet also profo uh, provided profound advice, highly relevant to how you craft your futures. Rilke wrote, don't search for the answers, which could not be given to you now because you would not be able to live them. Live the questions now. Perhaps then, someday far in the future, you will gradually, without even noticing it, live your way into the answer. So celebrate your enormous good fortune to have had the opportunity to study in this wonderful cauldron of learning. Use your gift to be evangelists for this music we all believe in and love so passionately. Most of all, Find a way to remember that you're leading your lives making music is a privilege, not an entitlement. And be happy and grateful that doing it is something only you can work on. If you do the work, you'll have a lot more fun that way. I guarantee it. I wish you all the best, and thank you for the opportunity to be here today.
Bruce, thank you so much for being here with those inspirational remarks. And, and we know that you're going to continue to be a, a force in our field. And your, your love of, of music is what was, comes through through everything you've done in your career. And I, I know that will continue to be your driving force. And so it's our great pleasure to present you with an award as our keynote speaker at the 2016 commencement. Thank you, Bruce Kopic. Thank you.